Welcome to The Upshot, Multi World Disc Golf's podcast about the latest in the disc golf world. I'm the editor, Charlie Eisenhood. Joining me is Josh Mansfield. Josh, welcome to March. We're here and it means the weather is starting to warm up a little bit. And, you know, I'm going to get out there on the disc golf course a little bit more. <laughs> the snow's melted. Uh, I, I got out there President's Day and uh, had a nice day and it's, you know, it's, it's starting to feel like spring is here. You know, the tour is back. You know, we got the Masters coming up around the corner. Love it. Yeah, uh, we have a projected snowstorm for Sunday. So I, I am sorry <laughs> for you. <laughs> I, I'm going to be reporting that until probably mid-July, though. So d- don't don't think that's going away anytime soon. But it is definitely getting warmer here. I went to work yesterday. Didn't even take a jacket with me. Uh, there you go. Because it was a balmy 43 degrees, which <laughs> for me felt awesome. So I can't believe February is over, though. It felt like I blinked, and now we're in March. Off we go. Uh, no, no. No big tournament this weekend, but the biggest non-big tournament of the year, maybe. <laughs> uh, the Memorial is happening down in Arizona. Just an A-tier now. Um, aside from Throw Pink, which is technically an A-tier, I think this is the number one A-tier of the season. Of course, the traditional start of the tour for like 20 years. Um, and uh, you know, Paul McBath will start his season this weekend. A lot of top pros are playing it. Not everybody, but it is, you know, it's going to be better than some silver series in terms of uh, field quality. So should be fun to see how that all shakes out. I believe uh, Terry Miller will have post-production coverage of that event after he did the the same thing last year. So I'm looking forward to seeing how it goes. Uh, Is it, you know, is it, is it a Paul McBeth or bust weekend? Or do you think the field's competitive enough that Paul might not win? You know, I would not be shocked to see Drew Gibson really put up a good fight here. He's got the power. He's got the distance. And if his putter was what is what it was last weekend, I think he could be in really good shape. Uh, We've seen Adam Hammes beat Paul McBeth head to head. Linus could have a really good weekend. I mean, it feels like I mean, the the odds on Paul McBeth are probably, you know, double what they are. Anybody (laughs) Else, but it, I don't think it's quite a shoe in for Macbeth. I think he's going to still have to have a good weekend, especially since it's his first tournament of the offseason. And AB played really well here last year. Um, I can't remember where he finished exactly. He got third, um, but he was he was on fire and just gave away some strokes in the final round. Macbeth won it uh, over Paul Ulibarri last year. With Owen Scoggins uh, beating Haley King in FPO, Owen Scoggins is back in the field, as is uh, a big group of strong players. Kristen Tatar, Hannah Blummer, Evelina Salin, and all the Europeans are playing this one. Uh, Jen Allen in the field as well. So, so Charlie, you, uh, you taking you take an own or one of the the European big three? I, I I know it's a little early in the show, but I actually have your over under for the week. Okay, well, let's just get to it right now. So it's it's kind of an odd. I don't know how to exactly phrase it, but two and a half okay. is where an American FPO player finishes. Okay, so so under so meaning you think she under, takes a I'm second saying, or first. So mm-hmm. you're basically or, being, or or another American player or another American player, right? Or any American player doesn't matter. Or do you think F uh, that the Europeans go one two and then after that, who knows? So you're Man. you're well, you're you're asking do one or two of the European women get beat or all three? Hmm. Ah, that's a tough one. That's a <laughs> tough one because I think this is like big time bounce back potential for Henna Blomroos, who is now going to be like, all right, let's shake off Vegas, come out here. There's going to be not nearly the same kind of pressure, mm-hmm. no live cameras, and you know, it's it's a course that for a player like Henna, you don't necessarily have to putt that much if you're throwing it well off the tee. So, um, and that means Evelina. Do I really want to pick shape. that they're going to go one two? Oh, I guess they just have one two. I don't have to go. They don't have to go one two three. It's not podium. I'm it's gonna, one two. I'm gonna take. 
the over. I think we're going to see Kristen and Evelina go one, two. Okay. All right. Or in, in some order. In some order. Sure. But you think yeah. Kristen and Evelina go one, two. I think you think so. there's a chance Henna comes up and plays well. So. I do. I mean, I, I, not that there's on people in the field who could do really well here. I mean, Jen Allen is certainly a threat. Um, Own one like, last year. Uh, of the six top rated players at this tournament, <laughs> three of the, uh, four of them are European because yeah. Katie Tata is, is coming as well from Estonia. Um, so I don't know. I, Tiger Bort's in the field, though, so look out. Emily Beach had a really um, good weekend at Vegas. She did. And Maria Oliva, Maria Oliva. is like leg- legitimately a threat at a course like this. So yeah. I, I don't know. I I still think that it's going to be one, two okay. with Evelina and uh, Kristen. So All right. th- there's, there's I got favorite. it down over, over two and a half. All right. Uh, let's get into the rest of this show. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the Las Vegas challenge. And I wanted to start the discussion with just what do we think of the event overall? Because. We had the questions about three courses, but you know, as we've mentioned, there if it's back next year, their plan is to go to two courses and to move the amateur side of the event from the current, you know, pro weekend to its own weekend. Now, as we, you know, in our preview show, we talked a bit about the financial challenges that the tournament faces because of the expense of renting out these golf courses. Um I guess what I would say is I hope they can overcome that Mm -hmm. because I think it's there. There's spectator benefits to moving the AMs off of that weekend. You know what you're gonna you're gonna have AMs who are gonna come play the event on the AM weekend are gonna stick around Vegas and then come to the pro event. That that's the dream, right? And that's it should be feeling like a destination event as something that you know you might want to say, hey, I'm going to fly out to Vegas. I'm going to spend a week in the sunshine, beautiful weather. I'm going to play a disc golf tournament, and then I'm going to get to watch the best pros in the world. This feels like where this tournament needs to go, and they're just going to have to figure out how to make the money work. I almost wonder if it would be a possibility. I know like the the disc golf con had all sorts of like events and rounds and and such i wonder if lvc could find a way to partner with them to rent out that space and and have it be the place where they run the am weekend but the am weekend is really just like with disc golf con right you go play that and then you stay for lvc obviously got canceled this year and so we don't really know to what capacity that's going to be successful but it seemed like there were a lot of people signing up for that i think it could boost your am weekend stats of how many people come out and play that you get a lot of tournament infrastructure and help from Infinite and this overarching you know, convention that you have going at the same time. You run tee times literally all day long for different rounds and divisions. You use all three courses for it. And then you have people who stay for the pro weekend. It, it I think it helps cover some of the overhead. I think it increases and boosts your, your spectators as well as your participant numbers. I think there's a partnership that could very well happen to help offset that cost. But again, that's speculation down the road. I completely agree though. Am weekend needs to be a different weekend so that this course and this facility can be redesigned and repurposed to a pro level tournament with two courses yeah, that are elite. There's just there's just a there's just a few too many holes out there across these courses that are not inspiring hmm. and don't don't need to be there. And like I think it, it all opens up more opportunities to do things like design an FPO layout that is very sensible. There are just holes that are are terribly designed for FPO mm-hmm. that have no scoring separation because they're too long. And you know, you can't just say, hey, play the same layout and then we're gonna change the par. That is not that we're, we're, that is such an old school mindset for like designing for FPO. We we have to get away from that. It, it's like shouldn't be allowed to happen anymore. Um, so the thing is, like you go to two courses, all of a sudden you open up the opportunity to really make two really good high quality courses for both MPO and FPO. Mm-hmm. I love the combine this with disc golf con idea because. I, I think disc golf con was designed to be at the Las Vegas Convention Center, which is, you know just gigantic convention center sure. downtown. 
um, right, right, you know, right off the strip, or maybe even on the strip, close to the hotels. Um, and the thing is, you don't necessarily need to do it that way. You, if you combined into this Vegas Am weekend, you could do it at the golf course, assuming they have enough facility out there. And then you know you have this like big disc golf celebration. Uh, you know the question is like with the Innova affiliation of the tournament, would there be some potential clash there with with Infinite? I mean, obviously those two companies already work closely together with Innova making Infinite's discs, so I wouldn't see that as like a, a deal breaker of of some kind. But it's a really it's a compelling idea because. You want to find a way to to make the money work. Mm -hmm. And the other thing about two courses is that maybe you could get away with having one fewer practice day for the pros because now they don't have to play three courses. They only have to play two. Very likely. I mean, that basically necess you, you need one fewer day mm -hmm. to get ready. I also think like if the pros have to pay a little bit more for the greens fees to cover the cost of the of the facility rental okay <laughs> like is it really going to make that much of a difference if you charge an extra 25 bucks i i i wouldn't really think so um you know that this is a popular tournament i think it has the potential to really stick around and it can be made great it can be made great i mean somebody in the uh ulti world disc golf subscriber discord was talking about you know they're there on the ground and that it was just a tremendously well-run event. Very professional. Uh, the facilities were amazing. And that is one thing that goes under-discussed, mostly because people are just watching on, on video and they're not there. But you know, when you rent out a really nice golf facility, you're going to have amenities that are not at a lot of tournaments. So I think, you know, I feel... I'm feeling maybe extra positively about Vegas after this weekend and the golf, uh, you know, the exciting finishes that we had. But I also think that, like, this is a smart place to begin the year. Las Vegas is a great city to visit. You know, I don't want to go to Stockton, California to go to the OTB Open. Like, I am much more likely to want to go to Vegas, even if the course, the courses in Vegas are not my favorites on tour. That's not what it's all about at every single event. So I think go forth, let's improve the courses. Let's move the AMs off this weekend. And I think that, you know, you find a way to make the money work. I, and I, the one thing I will add, it, you know, Vegas is never going to be my favorite tournament and that's okay. It doesn't need to be. Um, sure. But there are enough places, enough tournament directors enough destination locations that we could rent out a golf facility and put up a temporary course for a tournament in somewhere warm Orlando or, you know, down in the Bay area or, you know, wherever Southern California, we could find places to run the first event of the year. And so I am in agreement. I think Vegas has the potential to be excellent it needs to hear, and it sounds like by moving to two courses, they are, right? They're, they're listening. They're hearing the feedback. It has felt like that that has fallen on deaf ears in the past, and I think that's where a lot of the critique mm -hmm. is coming out for Vegas, and it's why people said, give us something else. I think next year is going to be really, really important for Vegas because if it doesn't go well, if we don't get the courses that I really think Vegas, the facility has the potential to give, and it isn't the weekend that... I really think they could deliver on, then I would not be shocked if in 2024 you had a competitor come up and say, bring it here. We'll be the opening start of the season. Right. Look at this facility. Look at this event we're going to run. Look at these courses. Exactly. I mean, competition, it's coming. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing for everybody. And, you know, Vegas has to keep getting better. It, yep. has, to, it has to take steps forward next year or it's going to lose its spot. I, I mean, we, we've talked about this. I think, I think that's true. One thing I loved about this event was the cut line. Loved it. Three rounds, do a cut at the cash. Then, you know, you have slim down fields for the final day. Uh, I was just talking to a pro about this. Mm -hmm. The disc golf seemed to have moved away from cut lines for the most part. 
I mean, remember we used to do final nines. Like, there's probably a bunch of listeners who are like, "What is a final nine? You know, they used to get to the end of a tournament, and then the top four players would play an extra nine holes to determine the winner." Uh, which you know was this sort of strange vestige of old school disc golf, and you know, about five years ago we stopped doing it. Um, but you know, you had these. That, no, I don't really want to call that a cut because that was more like a bonus for the top players, but. Having a cut line creates drama and interest earlier in the event. Mm -hmm. It also makes it much easier to get your tee times in, not have a bunch of backups with a bunch of, you know, bad players out on the course on your final day when you're trying to showcase the game. Um, I don't recall backups being a major problem during the final round at any point. And the other thing is, you know, you have the drama of not only like who's going to get to play on Sunday, who's going to cash, right? Think about the drama with, with Nate Sexton and Kale LaVisca. It would not necessarily have been as interesting if they had an extra day to get back into the cash, right? So Nate Sexton has to birdie out in order to keep his cash streak alive. And he does it. He gets four in a row. Incredible. And Kale comes up just barely short. Missed a circle one putt on the final hole to to lose the to to not cash, um, and you know, tip of the cap to Kale Lavisca for uh, the he had the longest active cash streak in terms of number of events. Nate Sexton's is longer in duration, um, mm-hmm. but you know it was something like almost three hundred and fifty events for Kale where he cashed. So uh, you know that may never happen again. <laughs> the the all time record is Climo, something like four hundred and sixty. And then you had Kales, and his his active streak is done. Sexton pulled it off by the skin of his teeth, <laughs> and uh, you know it's just going to get so much harder to to win week in and week out. When you have players who are averaging ten twenty golf that don't make the cut, welcome to a new world in professional <laughs> disc golf. What did you think of the cut line? I thought it was amazing, and and the reason I, I want to just add a couple of details to what you said because I think everything you said was spot on first off in terms of the backups it lvc isn't a notorious backup course right when you think a notorious backup you think uh ledgestone in northwoods right um that that is a notorious <laughs> backup place um but notorious after just w- one season on <laughs> The new black layout, but yes, no, the golds, was, the golds as well. The golds though, have on big problems too. That, uh, I know, I know. You're right. Whole, you're right. Yeah, uh, is it 15? I think 12. Well, anyway, I think um, it's 12. I think it's the, 12. The par five <laughs> double tunnel. I want to play yeah. that hole so bad. Just, I, I really don't. To be honest, <laughs> I know I'd get my would, lunch eaten, but I really want to play like, it. I'd be going zigzag <laughs> into the woods. <laughs> um. Anyway, but there were over times, under ten and a half. <laughs> Okay, I I will make it I, when I make that trip, Charlie. I will take that over <laughs> under, and I'm going to beat ten. <laughs> it may be sorry. Continue. Maybe a lot of putter shots up the middle, just nice and slow chip shot up. But you know what? Slow and steady. That's running scared, Josh. That's running scared. <laughs> it is running scared. <laughs> um, but I will say, if you look at the dis- if you watch the live coverage, there were plenty of sh- like images of like Calvin Heinberg sitting on his bag and just laying down on the ground, and Haley King playing hacky sack, and there there were backups for our later cards. And while it may not have been a huge problem, it's enough that I think, like you said, the final round looks much more professional. It looks smooth when you don't have those same backups. So I think the cut played a big role in that. The other thing, you know, day three, it's moving day. It's an important day, but you still are saying, oh, yeah, you know, there's a lot of golf to go tomorrow, so it's not the end of anything. But I was very closely uh, – I was going to UDISC and watching I, – I had the coverage up, but I was spending most of my attention watching the cash line farther down on the UDISC. Is Kona going to make cash? Is Kale going to make cash? Is Nate going to make cash? Like Those were questions that I was actively following. And I know not every disc golf fan and consumer are, are as interested in that, but I think it does provide some extra excitement earlier in the tournament that, and also tells us something really important because, like you said, 
if you're averaging 10, 20 golf and you have to average 10, 20 golf in order just to take home some money to recoup some fees that you put into this tournament, it, it's about to get really cutthroat on tour to That's use exciting. earnings in order to stay. And, and, and it's true. Casey white said this to us last season. He's like, I went into some tournaments and said, if I don't cash this weekend, I need to go home for a month. Like, I, I yeah. cannot stay on tour. That's the reality that a lot of pros are living in. I would prefer a world where we have pros who are able to tour. But even in PGA, the lower the lower rated pros who are just on the cusp of being inside that, you know, having a tour card or being able to qualify, they are also kind of in a grind. And you've got to play well in order to stay on tour. It creates excitement and drama around it about who's going to be at the tournament next weekend and what it's going to look like. So here's the question. Yep. <clears throat> should three. So I th- I feel like every four round tournament should have a cut. Yes. Without exception. And I include, you know, four plus. So world should have a cut. Mm-hmm. Every four round or five round tournament should have a cut. What about three round tournaments? Because we have lots of elite series events that are just three rounds. Do you cut after two rounds? I, I've been, that just I, as a note. On the PGA Tour, two rounds cut, two, two rounds. rounds cut. I'm going to say I'm going to say yes, and the reason why I'm going to say yes is because the golf is getting so competitive that, and and you, Terry Miller asked Drew Gibson during his post round final interview after he won. He said, you know, Drew, your last Elite Series win was also in a playoff. Can't you just get it done in regulation? And Drew goes, well, when you shoot a five under round one, then it's kind of hard to do that. Um, (laughs) Backhanded compliment for sure. I I know. It really was. Uh, And Drew hit the nail on the head, right? Like he he did not have a good round one. I think in the world of three round tournaments, a five under disqualifies Drew from winning. I mean, he's still three strokes off the lead after round three. Maybe he could have pushed and caught. Maybe, you know, in that scenario, it's a little bit different. He probably makes the cut, though, right? You, he probably makes after the cut. After two rounds? Yeah, yeah, you're, I think you, yeah. You're, you're probably right. So he, he probably makes the cut. he might not the win cut. the tournament because of having a bad round in round one. Right. But but my point is, is that if you have two rounds that are bad enough to miss the cut, there is, I don't think, a mathematical chance that you ever win a tournament. No, but I think the players don't think about trying to win. They think about trying to cash. And that's true. And the question becomes, is two rounds enough to start determining who is going to cash or not? And you don't have to necessarily cut at the cash line like they did for this weekend. Mm -hmm. You could cut another, let's say you're paying 40%. You could cut at 50% and give those next... You know that that bottom ten percent who's outside currently outside the cash a chance to play into it, but you know you tell the other you tell the bottom half thanks for coming we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm. If you if you have two courses on the same course and so it's you know because three round tournaments are the one course if it's at the single course and your goal going in is like I just need to cash, you know you've got to play well for two rounds and I, I don't. I guess I guess I'm not I don't think we should just say, well, well, give them a third round so that they have, you know, a chance to make up for a bad round. Like if you're going to cash play well for two rounds yeah. and your bad round can be your third round. <laughs> I, I, I think I think I agree. I think I agree. I, I think the 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 historical argument against it has been that, well, people are paying to play. They want to have a chance to play three rounds. It feels unfair to only give them two rounds. But we are very close to the point at which I just say I do not care about your enjoyment of playing in the event. If you want to play an event because you just want to play an event, then like you're not a professional level player who should be playing at Elite Series tournaments. And if we're going to do this as an Elite Series event, the the added drama of a cut, the reduced stress on scheduling mm-hmm. that is created by a cut, 
I think the benefits outweigh the costs, particularly when you're talking about, you know, players like everyone's going to say, oh, well, you know, I want to have the chance to make the cash on the final day. And it's like, well, we're just moving that bar up a little bit. Like, just deal with it. Right. That's how it works on the PGA Tour. Why can't we handle it in disc golf? I think there's certainly arguments for and against, but I, I just like the cut line a lot. I think it adds an element of intrigue into the middle rounds that otherwise doesn't exist. Because the thing I'm not doing on the final day of a tournament is like paying close attention to who's going to cash and not cash. I don't care. I'm watching to see who's going to win the tournament. Maybe if it's a huge blowout, I might go look at the cash line. But when you have a cut, now in round three, or let's say in round two, I'm I'm doing what you do. I'm like, hey, wait, who's going to miss the cut here? Because that's an exciting, interesting talking point in a round that can otherwise be sort of just forgotten as you get ready to watch the final round. Mm -hmm. So I like the I like the uh, concept. We'll see what happens. I would also, as resources become available, be interested if Disc Golf Network could send one crew, a you know, a primary cam <laughs> and a catch cam to players on their like hole sixteen for guys who are right around the cut line. I would have watched Nate Sexton try and birdie out to make cut. That's a good point. And see if Kale can make the putt to I mean it's a fair point. I would watch I, that. I feel like the the re- the camera resources do not allow for something like that particularly you know it's just like way out of the way of where the actual cameras are otherwise but it it there's an argument to be made that like that's just as interesting during round three Mm -hmm. as what's going on at the top of the leaderboard eventually and certainly you see you see (laughs) you see pga tour coverage showing players who are right around that cut trying to birdie to make it Mm -hmm. and that can be very interesting depending on the players who are there um, one other thing I noticed is, is the spotter guy dancing with the flag? Like this is feeling like a meme at this point. There was some serious, you know, da, 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 da with the flag going on. Um, when, uh, when Gannon Burr went out of bounds on 18, I mean, the spotter was just like, so ready to just boom, red flag, like, and then and then when uh, I think well, it must have been when Drew was safe, when you know, Drew we got safe. the dancing uh-huh. flag guy. Yeah. Um, is it too much or is this like a fun, fun part of disc golf uh, that we have this, uh, you know, guys running all around the course with the flag? Uh, you know, at uh, at Worlds, I thought it was, it was kind of like a fun touch, right? It was, it was something we hadn't really seen a lot before. And maybe, maybe it did happen before and we just didn't notice it. Um, but the whole 18 at worlds really set up well for it. Uh, and then the gallery. So, so I don't know to what extent it happened before, but now I, and I don't want to be like a, a buzzkill, but it <laughs> feels distracting. I'm like, like, this is like the highest pressure moment of this tournament. And then it's, it's broken by some dude waving this flag around. Like Gannon still had a putt to make. Like, I, I don't know. Um, it feels a little bit like when the NBA refs like want to make it about them. <laughs> or you see an umpire, you know, like get a little aggressive with the throwing somebody out because they like feel like they're the star of the show. It's starting to feel a little bit like that. I mean, I appreciate the passion. I really do. Uh-huh. But, you know, I don't know. It's I- just. Imagine you're there if, to do a job, and like I don't really want to see people high stepping all over the course every time. When James Conrad throws it in from two forty seven, high step, <laughs> high step it, okay. <laughs> but like, it's just LVC. Like, let's let's take the tone down a little bit. Maybe maybe we're sticks in the mud on this one. The, maybe, the commenters will let us know for sure. <laughs> imagine if like, imagine you hit a home run and tie it up at the bottom of the ninth and then the mascot just goes running out of the field <laughs> well okay the mascot that's a different thing if we want to have a disc golf mascot go out there then okay like you know the bulldog or whatever i don't want that um, either charlie <laughs> but like imagine if the umpires just started high stepping onto the on the field when somebody hit a walk-off you know like <laughs> it's a little silly to think about 
Um, yeah, well, I don't know. I, it, it's it's a thing. Like people are seeing this and now replicating it at other tournaments. Um, uh, here, here's your comparison. It's the umpire in tennis just stands up. It's out on a big point and just starts waving his hands. <laughs> <laughs> like doing a little like is out. Oh yeah. my gosh. <laughs> um I'm not sure I have the answers here. Okay, uh let's talk about Disc Golf Network's coverage this weekend. Uh I saw lots of people very excited about it. Um it sounds like they've uh, added some more subscribers. No surprise there. And here's the big news. This was the most watched FPO live broadcast ever. It beat out Worlds from 2021 by about 1,000 people. It was around 17,000 people concurrently watching live uh, when you com- combined the YouTube and the DGN stream numbers. Uh, and uh, MPO was was the second most watched all time behind worlds. I mean, worlds, it was pretty exciting down the stretch, wasn't it? Um, so really good numbers for disc golf network, uh, during the final round. And, you know, I, I, I don't really have much to say about that besides the fact that we know that, you know, professional disc golf is getting more popular. First event of the year, more people kind of clued into the professional scene than ever before. And I think we're probably going to see generally upward trends in rounds. I mean, you know, maybe Waco won't be as good as LVC because it's not the first event of the year. But when we get to Worlds, when we get to European Open and the majors, I think we could see even higher numbers than ever before. Um, What did you think of the coverage itself? Let's talk about that. Um, I really enjoyed the coverage. I I thought it was... I thought there were some really good shots. Here's the one thing I will say that I think is interesting. And I don't know if it was a a conscious decision or just placement, but if you see the Jomez coverage of the final round and the playoff, you've got Drew Gibson putting and you still have Gannon Burr in frame and kind of showing him and how devastated he is by, by missing that putt. I mean, the screw, the still of that camera angle is a really excellent photo. It's really good. Um, and and I kind of wish Disc Golf Network had shown that as well, because going back and watching it on Jomez, I was like, wow, that's that's a that's really, really good camera work. Uh, and I would have loved to see that on Disc Golf Network. They may, their cameras may have just been in the wrong place. Jomez may have just beat them to it. I, I don't know. But it overall, I really don't have a lot of complaints, except, except the sound was still atrocious. Some of the interviews started out so quiet I couldn't hear them. And then some of the ads were so quiet that I couldn't, I, I literally just walked away during the ads because I couldn't hear what they were saying. Um, there were times when Ian would kick it down to Terry and then it would go about 30, 35 seconds. And then he would go, we'll get back to Terry once he finds the unmute button and it just starts <laughs> yeah. talking again. So yeah, that's, that's been a, that's been a known issue for, for a few tournaments now. Yeah. H- hiccups overall though, I was very impressed and I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. I mean, I think the thing that, that is obvious is that the fact when they split the coverage, which is the plan for most Elite Series events this year, and they have a separate MPO and FPO broadcast, Mm -hmm. the fact that you're able to focus all the cameras on the one division happening at the one time means you have a lot more to work with as a producer. So you don't have to split off one of your cameras to go start covering the beginning of the FPO round, which is going to reduce the ability to show what's going on in MPO, and you also only have one camera on FPO. So instead, you get to focus all of the cameras and show more shots. If you are tuning in this weekend, what you saw was basically nonstop disc golf shots. And whenever I, you know, look at people talking about the coverage of of PGA events, the thing that pisses everybody off the most (laughs) is when they're showing like some random interview or some little feature instead of showing golf shots. And DGN is doing an amazing job of simply showing golf shots. 
We are seeing them throw the disc, putt the disc, and we are able to follow along with what's going on. And that was better than ever this weekend. Mm -hmm. You were seeing the shots. There were not as many interstitial graphics. There were not as many, you know, waiting just to watch people putt. They were still showing the leaderboard. We were getting the dr live drone shots. Um, the coverage really just looks nice. It's pleasing to sit and watch. If I'm going to nitpick the new little mini scoreboard that they have up a lot of the time, number one, it's a little too big. Number two, it just doesn't need to be on the screen at all times. Put it up there 80% of the time, sure. But sometimes when it's like a big shot on 18 and we're getting ready to watch somebody huge shot and the the, the graphic overlay is like in their sh in the shot like covering up things on the screen take it down in those moments please um but i mean that's nitpicking that's nitpicking, that's nitpicking yeah. right yeah. i'm i'm picking at a graphic thing the overall coverage was extremely enjoyable to watch mm -hmm. it's just as simple as that it was great to watch we're seeing shots that is the thing that people want and if you show the shots and they've gotten so much better at handling like catching us up with replays and other things, uh, just a, a a much more overall pleasant viewing experience than what we saw at All-Star Weekend. And uh, I think it bodes really well for the future. Uh, the fact is, more cameras really does make a difference. And you can tell when they're able to show three cards deep of what's going on and you're just getting nonstop action. Uh, and when you mentioned the replays as well, and I thought they were so well done to catch me up on exactly when Chris Dickerson, they showed like the putting montage, I think from round one, where he's just draining putt after putt after putt after putt. I was like, thank you for showing me this because Chris Dickerson was on one of the earlier cards for and didn't get uh, any coverage, a lot of coverage. I don't know how much coverage he got. Um, I, I was in and out of the MPO on day one. Um, and but I was able and, and that's that's the point, though. Right. There are going to be people, especially in early days of tournaments, when it's not the weekend, who are at work, who are, you know, probably have it up on their phone or on their computer and are just kind of watching it on the side while they're doing other work. <clears throat> and it uh, for them to just be able to show me, oh, here's seven Chris Dickerson circle two putts that he cashed. I already have that storyline in my head going into round two. Chris Dickerson's our leader, and it's because he cashes circle two putts right now at this tournament. And then when his putter goes cold, I it, it becomes a storyline. It develops the storyline. I was caught up, and it took him 30 seconds to do so. I was very, very pleased with the coverage this weekend as well. Uh, and, and it's generally better to see it as a montage like that than to see it as a as a graphic. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think they're doing a nice job of using the, the actual footage to tell the stories and not rely as heavily on, you know, slates. Um, so just overall, I thought it was a really nice job. And I, I think uh, it's it's not just that it was a close tournament and it was the first tournament of the year. There were a lot of people tuned in because people tuned in and were interested and stuck around. And that's how you end up with great numbers. Um, Record setting FPO, second most watched all time in MPO. So nice job to the DGN folks. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we've got a couple segments for you. We're going to ask some questions that we still have heading out of LVC into the rest of the season. And we're going to also talk about what's more likely. I'm going to give you two options. Debate which of them is more likely. So stick around. You're listening to The Upshot. The Upshot is presented by Pound Disc Golf, makers of the best bags in the sport. Now, you know I like a smaller bag. I carry a Pound Toolbox around the course, but I am getting a little tired of lugging the bag and having to carry it in my hand. Well, good news, small bag lovers, because I have it on good authority that the Rufus, the new smaller bag from Pound, is coming soon. So keep your eyes peeled to Pound Disc Golf social media to see when you'll be able to get your hands on the new Rufus. I know I will have one. PoundDiscGolf.com
Welcome back to The Upshot. Things have changed. The light has changed. <laughs> Josh, Josh has changed. It's a little later in the day, so, you know, uh, I, I hope you've been, had, a, had a, a nice long break here in the intermission, Josh. <laughs> You know, no, I, I have my large, my large Coke from Maverick. It was a really long 12, four hours at work. I'm glad for the break to come back and talk about the upshot a little more. Maverick. Is that like the, the your mm -hmm. gas station go to? Yes. So Mavericks are, I don't think they're in Montana, but Idaho, Utah, they are the cleanest and nicest gas stations you can go to. So I've got one right next to my office, which is a problem to be honest, but uh, when I will go out of my way to go to a Maverick above any other gas station. Okay, so so you don't do you have Mavericks then? Uh, I well, assume not. I am familiar with the brand, but okay. I don't know why. I think it's probably because I they are in the, they're in the West where I you know they probably have in New Mexico. Um, sure. The, the 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 one out here that that people will really go for is Wawa. Okay, oh, okay. Do you know so what's, what is that about Wawa? I've never heard oh, of it. Oh, wow. Wow. Some of our <laughs> listeners are going to be like, oh, yeah, Wawa. <laughs> uh, Wawa is like New Jersey, Pennsylvania. There may be some in parts of New York. They're not. I mean, in New York City, it's like a whole weird zone with gas stations. But sure. Um, Wawa has really good food. They have like sub sandwiches oh. that are generally considered like on par better than like what you could get at subway or something like that so people go okay. you know people go there to get a meatball sub you know and fill up gas and it's nice inside they have a lot of nice food options and things um sheets is a big pennsylvania one also competes with wawa i know some big I thought you were about to tell me that wawa sells sheets <laughs> and i was like wow they have everything i'm trying to think of the <laughs> other ones like Every every region of the country has its own like go to gas station. <laughs> now the the Publix grocery store chain down in Florida, that's uh -huh. where you go. Yeah, I don't even know if they okay. have gas, but like you go to Publix and you order like <laughs> the chicken tender sub sandwich. I feel like we could do an okay, entire I'll show about like <laughs> gas stations and grocery. Charlie, stores. I have to tell you something really quick. Back in like one of my first episodes, we were on. You and Casey White talked about how good Culver's is. Oh, Culver's. I had it for the first time last two weekends Where ago. Where were you? Down in Utah. I went down to Utah for Culver's a disc golf there. tournament. Just a little C tier. Yeah, they have Culver's right, down give there. Give us your review. So I, I was good. I got the spicy chicken sandwich. Okay. You know, I'm not a crinkle fry kind of guy. Mm. That's I think their fries are so, one of their weakest links. Yeah, but the sandwich was really good. Uh, and then the shake was awesome. Oh, the ice so, cream there is yeah. tip top. I love it. It was, uh, it was a good experience. So, <laughs> all right. Um, I was just last thing. I was just in New Mexico yeah. <laughs> for a short ski trip and mm -hmm. I went to Blake's lot burger. Now we probably okay. have almost no listeners in New Mexico. So people are not going to know what I'm talking about, but if you ever go, you've got to go to Blake's, you got to order the, the, the Blake's lot burger with the double patty, the cheese and the green chili, get the seasoned fries. You can go with the shake if you want. Amazing. You New Mexico guys and your green chilies. It's, I have a friend from New Mexico and he just could not live without green I chilies. I buy it at Costco, giant jars <laughs> to make stuff here in New York. And I ha literally have over on the table over here a bunch of New Mexican like red chili, green chili salsa and a, uh, a red chili honey that you put on the sopapillas. Mm. All right. We're, we're moving on. <laughs> If you ever need New Mexico <laughs> tips, email upshot at oldsyroll.com and I will give them to you. Um, we are going to do a segment now that we s say what what's more likely, okay? <laughs> We're going to dig into some topics that kind of have come to mind over beginning of the season, start L LVC, what we're going to see coming up at Waco, and uh, we're going to ask what's more likely. So, Josh, I'll uh, let you have the honors here. You know, I'm going to start with the epitome of consistency and ask you which one do you think has the better chance that, of doing better this season? Missy Gannon or Sarah Hokum, which one has the better season? The better season. Yes. Mm. You know, and that's obviously going to be up for debate a little bit when we get to it, but. Here's an interesting fact, okay? So Missy Gannon. Okay. Most people are going to just automatically go to Missy Gannon. 
Right. Is he gained one? In my sense, a little questionably, one disc golf pro, pro tour player of the year. Obviously had an amazing mm-hmm. finish, got some big wins uh, to close yep. out with two huge wins at the end of the year. I, I think most people would agree that she had a better season than Sarah Hokum, who was yes, limited with I would injury with at some points. Mm-hmm. However, Sarah Hokum has a higher rating and has for some time. And Sarah Hokum has been working on her backhand and is using it more. Um, Missy finished higher this weekend. Significantly. Sarah was like below the cut for part of round three. So uh, it doesn't shock me. I mean, I don't know that, you know, LVC is the spot for Sarah Hokum to really rock out. Um, I'm going to go with Missy Gannon mostly because I think the trajectory of her game has been clearly more on the upslope. Sarah Hokum has remained certainly very consistent, but I don't know that she's going to get a lot better from here. Uh, I think Missy has the higher ceiling. That's that's a fair point. I am going to go with Sarah Hokum. I think Missy Gannon will probably event. I mean, it's hard to say because, you know, Sarah will probably eventually start to decline. But when that is, who knows? Uh, in at least for this season, though, I still am going to take Sarah Hokum, who is nearly 15 points higher than Missy Gannon. 10 points. Yeah, more than more than 10 up. points higher in rating. Yeah. And, and look, Sarah Hokum, here's the thing. It depends a little bit on what you value. I, Missy Gannon had more wins in 2021. Sarah Hokum, though, is just churns out the <laughs> top five finishes, you know, lots of third second place finishes all through the back especially in the back half of the season i mean Mm -hmm. third at ledgestone third at isle wild second at delaware second at gmc third at the match play second at music city third at throw pink second at dgpt championship well but who won the dgp championship you know (laughs) so (laughs) right right pick your poison i think wins 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 way out but you know sarah hokum can win too we know this Mm-hmm. Yep. And I think you take away even one of Missy Gannon's wins from last season. And you now have a compelling discussion about who, which one had a better season. So uh, granted she didn't. So I think Missy Gannon did have the better season last year, but I'm interested to see what happens this year. So what's more likely Gannon bird doesn't podium again this season, or he does podium again. I am going to say, oh, man, that's so hard because we're going off of Vegas, which banking anything off of Vegas is bad. Um, I'm going to say it's more likely that he doesn't. And I'm probably going to get some flack for this. I think that this i mean there were a lot of things that went right for gannon don't get me wrong gannon is an amazing player he has an amazing potential and he very well could podium again this season but ricky was still figuring out the new bag paul Macbeth wasn't there sure. eagle was injured yep. right uh chris dickerson had a new bag uh you name it and there are a lot of factors that broke right for gannon burr to have such a good good tournament um uh, and then kind of cracked under nerves a little bit. So I, I am going to go with more likely that he doesn't last season. He was fourth at the preserve. That was his best finish. Had a top 10 here and there fifth at the pro tour championship. I don't think I can disagree. I think it's more likely that he doesn't podium, but I would say that about almost all players. <laughs> There's a handful of guys that I would say are more likely to to podium mm-hmm. than not and gannon burr is not quite on that list yet but the fact that this is a conversation tells you what you need to know the problem is statistically you can only pick three of them to say that they're more likely to podium <laughs> than not well right? no that because point. it's at a, at a given oh, tournament could, i would agree but over the course yeah. of the season you have a little bit more uh opportunities there you're right i'd have to do the i'm curious about the math on that anyway uh yeah okay i've got one for no. you are we going to see more playoffs to decide tournaments or st- wins that are by three or more strokes? So what's more likely 
mm-hmm. playoffs or three plus stroke wins? Um, dang. I'm trying to remember the last time we saw a kind of dominant wins. It's been rare lately. Um, I still think three plus stroke wins is probably the more likely thing. Playoffs happen, but they're not common enough for me to feel like they're going to outweigh the weekends where somebody pulls away. And it doesn't take that much to pull away. It can be really close in the final round, and then somebody goes out of bounds, and then all of a sudden it's four strokes, and that's it. So I'm going to say mm-hmm. three plus stroke wins, but it's it's tough because it's definitely getting more competitive and it's I think it's getting less and less likely where you have somebody win by, you know, five to ten strokes, just dominate. Do, do you want me to give you a fun little stat? Sure. Here, um, not including the disc golf pro tour championships because you can't really compare that. One that. Really, you can't play. really. No. Yeah. Um, so not counting that one, the past three tournaments have all had a playoff, whether an MPO or FPO. Is that right? Music City Open and USDGC slash Throw Pink, Paul McBeth, Kyle Klein, because right. Music City Open was Ricky and Mason, yep. and then LVC is now Drew and Gannon. Wow. So MPO has had a playoff the past three tournaments. Wow. That is that is surprising. You have to go back to the Green Mountain Championship, where Chris Dickerson won by three strokes. <laughs> in order to find a tournament that did not go to a playoff. How about that? So fun one. All right. Um, what's more likely a European MPO player podiums at an elite series event or a European FPO player wins player of the year. I, Oh my gosh, (laughs) this one's a great one, Charlie. Um, I think that it's probably more likely that an MPO player podiums. It only takes one tournament of things to go right at a course that suits really well for an MPO player to, and <clears throat> remember, we didn't have all the MPO players. At we also have European open on the calendar. And we have, oh yeah, yeah. And European open. So when you include all all those factors, I think there's a really just the odds are much higher that something breaks right there. Uh, FPO player of the year is going to require. I mean, it being completely frank, it requires Kristen or Evelina to turn it around really fast because they are going to have to compete with a fuller resume from any American FPO player who plays the full tour as opposed to their mostly Fair full point. tour. I mean, Christian Tatar is emphasizing DGPT, maybe a little more so That's than Evelina. So in some ways, maybe mm-hmm. you're betting on Christian Tatar with this with this exercise. But, you know, the majors, get a couple majors, uh-huh. you might win. You don't even have to do anything else. And that's true. And that's true. But I think I agree with you, I'm, but <laughs> it's, it's close. It's close. It really is. Because there was there was sort of serious discussion last year as to like does Kristen Tatar deserve to be in the conversation for player well of the year? yeah it was I mean, it was quickly dismissed but it was enough she had a she solid enough it. stretch that some people talked about it and that should tell you a lot all right I have another one for you this is the first one. this is okay. what made me think of this segment what's okay. more likely Paige Pierce wins the most elite series events again this year as she did in 2021 or mm-hmm. No FPO player wins more than four. So I, I kind of already took a little bit on this one because on our sub bonus in the live show, I uh, I banked on Paige not winning an obscene number of uh, events, um, much to the chagrin of some other ulti world staff. But <laughs> uh, I think, oh man, the no FPO because... I think that the only way Paige, I can't win, Charlie. I can't win here because <laughs> <laughs> if if I pick Paige wins most elite series majors again, then I I've now you know put bets on either side of that. But if I say no FP, FPO player wins more than four, then I'm saying that oh man, you know what? Give me the no FPO player wins more than four. I'm taking it. I am not. 
here's what my think I think is more likely. Katrina Allen wins the most elite series majors oh, okay. this year. You're gonna go extra spicy. That's that that's my I'm feeling. A lot right of Katrina's now. gonna dominate this year takes after one tournament. Just saying. It's it's not I don't know, man. She did look good. She looked she good. Looked good. She looked good. So, uh, but I'll probably take the no FPO player wins more than four. All right. On this Let's move on to some questions that we have as we head into uh, this upcoming Waco uh, next weekend and just the rest of the year. And uh, I'm going to go with one right here off the top, Josh. Can Drew Gibson keep the putter hot? I mean, we're going to get a look at that this weekend at the Memorial. Um, if he can look out like this guy is going to be up in the mix and that remains a big question for me. Um, you know, is, is if, if that consistency remains with the putter and he shoots well from circle two, like he did in, in Vegas, he's going to be a uh, real, real tough to deal with. So, uh, that's something I'm watching for. How about you? What's noteworthy here, I think is that Drew Gibson really actually has two conditions that i really think could make him successful one is he keeps the putter as hot as it was in vegas but number two even if he were like reverts back and falls back to where he was last season maybe a little bit better circle two putting um then by doing so and then cleans up his ob strokes instead i think both are success are recipes for success uh i think it's a good question uh and i'm interested to see if it stays hot at the Memorial this weekend as well. Uh, my next question is also a putter question. Can Evelina Salen and fix it in time? That was, it's been her crutch. It was her crutch. She missed some really easy putts this weekend because you could just tell she was nervous. She wasn't comfortable. So that's a big question I have. And and you said it, you said it best in Europe when it's just the other two of them, you can play dominant enough to make up for a bad putter fields too deep here. This disrespectful to Hannah Blomru saying two of them. That's disrespectful. She won the European championship. No disrespect. No, I was saying Hannah and Kristen. Oh, oh the other two against okay, Hannah okay, and Kristen. Okay. The other okay. two. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was not leaving. Hannah out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I have one more putter one for you. <clears throat> okay. How long until Ricky gets comfortable with his new putter? Because if you look at the stats from Vegas, he was great, matched pretty much what we saw from him all 2021. I mean, he's throwing the disc great. Approaches look mm-hmm. great. He threw in his harp at one point from like 90 feet from the shrubs. Uh, and the thing is, when you look at the putting, 86% circle one. It's pretty good. He was 88% last year. So that's well within normal range. Um, he was 14% from circle two. Last year, he was a 33% circle two putter. So he doesn't have it dialed in yet from distance. And that's not a surprise. I mean, I, to, I think that's probably the f- the one thing that, you know, it re- requires just reps and feel more than anything else. You know, a sure. driver is a driver is a driver. But when you're talking about having the putter and just like exactly how that stability feels and the hand feel and just getting that touch back, you know, that's a pretty big discrepancy and it's maybe the reason that he wasn't up at the top of the leaderboard so how long is it going to take him to get comfortable that's uh something to keep an eye on i mean he basically said it himself that he felt like he played well but has more work to do it's a it's a great question so there's three putter questions that we're we're all waiting to hear the answers for my next one i want to ask is this the year that Haley king can kind of mature as a player and develop consistency in her game Haley King has showed probably the highest ceiling of FPO players. When you're talking about greatest FPO player, Haley King could easily make a case for herself as being the next legitimate contender for that title. But she also makes the case for the most inconsistent player. Remember, she was one off the hot round, but through six OB strokes in round four. It it's a stat that still blows my mind. I hope it's this year. I think it will happen. My question is how soon? Yeah, it's, you know, even within rounds, you see that sometimes playing great, Mm -hmm. playing great makes an inexplicable major error and takes a double bogey. Uh, It happens on a regular basis and it Mm -hmm. holds her back sometimes, even though like, You know, she'll have weekends where she does really put it all together and and just straight dominates. 
It's a fair question to ask because I think if that focus gets dialed in, Haley King could be the best player in the division. But we just you, you got to have that week in week out consistency to be able to to you know get those wins. Last year at the Green Mountain Championship, when she shot a ten fifty two rating on round three, so crazy, scorching hot round, only wins the tournament by one stroke over Sarah Hokum because her round two was a nine thirty seven rated. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> think about that from nine thirty seven <laughs> to ten fifty two was it. Yeah, 52. Unreal. Uh, yeah. Great point. <laughs> I'm wondering how different is the top 10 going to look at Waco? Both divisions. Are we going to see a bunch of the same players popping back up? Very different. Very different tournament. Mm-hmm. Brazos East is not is not the wide open fairways of Las Vegas with no trees. You know, it's it's not woods necessarily, but it's park. It's mixed. Mm-hmm. We're going to see a lot more technical shot shaping. And so what does the top 10 look like? Do we get a whole new batch of people? I mean, obviously, there's going to be some crossover, but who are those crossover players? Is it the common names that we're getting used to seeing up at the top every every year? Or are we going to see some new people start to emerge and, and, st- and we're going to start to ask ourselves, wait a minute, you know, is this the year that Luke Humphreys is going to break out and suddenly become a, a contender? You know, I would expect this is what I, I think is noteworthy. Is Waco is also a tournament that shakes up a lot. Uh, I mean, Colton Montgomery won it a couple of years ago. It was Nico last and year. Kona. This tur- and Kona, right? This tournament showcases different players. I don't know what it is about Waco exactly, and maybe we'll talk a little bit more about this when our preview show is next week. But Waco is definitely one that I think is going to highlight a diverse top ten probably going to be different than Vegas. I think any pro who maybe isn't our headline name, but performs well both at Vegas and at Waco might be someone worth consideration there. If Luke Humphreys puts it together and takes another top five, I think you really need to start looking at how Luke Humphreys can perform over the season. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great take. All right, one more, Josh, what you Um, got? All right, my last one. I had a really big surprise when I went to the scoreboard and saw Kevin Jones up in fourth place. I want to know if Kevin Jones can play well when he's in contention. It seems like Kevin Jones plays best when everyone's written him off. Uh, (laughs) He comes from behind. But I mean, we've talked about this before. Kevin Jones on lead card seems to struggle. His best rounds i mean coming up into fourth was a uh, remarkable with a 13 under tying it for the hot round i want to see kevin jones do it on coverage i want to see it do it when he's in contention and i want to see that 13 under come when he's maybe in the fourth or fifth spot already and then not jumping up from 10th i mean it feels like the guy's been a little snake bit uh you know you remember back to portland open when he's got the lead oh, and yeah. then of course has that just vicious hole on the with the raised basket with ob everywhere and he rolls out of bounds and he misses 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 uh, and it was just kind of brutal because there were some of those putts that hit chains and just weren't lucky or he just barely missed high and hit the band is that playing bad arguably arguably you know <laughs> it, it it is it, there there have been times when kevin jones has been in the lead and made mistakes and lost the lead and we've seen it a bunch. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know that I feel like he's like suddenly just like shanking drives. You know, if you think back to Portland, that wasn't that. It was just, it's a tough hole and he got the worst of it. And unfortunately, the mistakes compounded. Uh, I, I think it's fair to ask. I feel like the answer to the question is yes. And I think that we're going to see Kevin Jones take down another Elite Series event this year. Uh, speaking of snake, but I, I went back and watched world's coverage the other day, just during the off season. You remember that brutal roll away when Kevin Jones, like in third, kind of close enough that we were still wondering if it's possible he could be important and then hits the cage and it, the putter just Was that on nice and slowly where it rolls just stood into the up water. and like slowly. Uh-huh. Did I say, I don't know what you said. Yeah, it was on 16. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. It was on 16. Oh my yeah. gosh. So you're definitely right. But we've also seen, was it D glow two years ago? Right. That Kevin was, we thought no one's ever going to catch Kevin, and he just kind of threw it away. So 
I I want to see I want to see him on coverage. I want to see him go round one tee off to final putt on eighteen in round four, lead a tournament and win it. Yeah, it's fair. I mean his his best win is probably GMC twenty twenty. That was a good one. Beat P- McBeth and Wysocki. Um, but you know you it feels like given his skill level that he should be winning two or three events a season and it's been mm-hmm. mostly zero to one. So we'll see. All right. And and yeah. Finish your thought. Okay. Well, I was just going to say that GMC Kevin Jones shot a seven under in the final round, but he still won by four strokes. I, so I, when I, I guess my, I should clarify contention to when it's close at fair, right. Fair. When, when you've got someone breathing down your neck and you don't have four strokes going into the nervy 17, 18 combo at uh, Brewster Ridge. So, all right. So uh, one little piece of news we wanted to talk about before we uh, signed it off. Announcement came out from the MVP open that MVP, the sponsor of the tournament at Maple Hill is signed back on as a, primary title sponsor for 10 years, $2 million. It's $200,000 a year. Josh, what do you think? I think this is one of the best investments in disc golf. When your name is synonymous with Maple Hill, you're going to make money. You're going to benefit from it. Your brand is going to have good imaging. I think it's an excellent, excellent investment by MVP. My question really is more about, is this enough money for the tournament to be getting? Uh, Because I I don't know what the going rate for title sponsorships of tournaments is. Now, Mm -hmm. I think $200,000 for year 2022 is a really, that's a great deal for the tournament. But mm-hmm. in five to 10 years, when this is still under contract, is that $200,000, which you have to discount because we're, you know, you got to, you got to think about seven, eight years from now, how much is that money going to be worth? It's going to be worth less because of inflation. So you got to apply a discount rate. And like, once you do that and you think about the potential growth of the pro tour and of the professional scene, that could feel like a really good bargain for MVP to only be paying 200000 a year for title sponsorship. Now, we don't know. We can't see the future. There's obviously, you know, to get a big long-term deal and get a big guaranteed payment of a couple million dollars that allows you to think about investing into the tournament, investing into the purse. Uh, that's, a, that's a great situation. But it does feel like maybe MVP is overpaying a little bit now, but this locks in a rate that could look very appealing in five, six, seven years. Uh, Charlie, you must not have watched the secret second video that says that this deal is actually just a handshake deal. (laughs) Um, The 10 years is completely optional. Um, Yeah, no, I I agree with you though. And that's, that's kind of why I feel like MVP is the winner here because we already saw with the disc golf pro tour, you have outside sponsors, LL Bean, Johnsonville sausages, uh guaranteed what's rate. the last one guaranteed rate thank you sponsor for last year's change they were the title sponsor uh, i mean you're having outside companies bringing in money how much we're not sure exactly but if they're bringing in hundreds of thousands of dollars if the sport continues to grow five hundred thousand dollars like i think mvp is definitely going to be cashing in on their investment over 10 years i'm curious to know is there a buyout clause what's you know, We're going to find out more next week when we talk to Steve Dodge on the Upshot interview series. And he's got some more information about the MVP Open. We're looking forward to talking with him so we can ask him those questions right here on the show. Uh, we have one quick mulligan. Ella Hansen had yes. more podium finishes than we mentioned on Tuesday's show. We're going to get the exact uh, number right now. Yep, I'm pulling it up right now. And I it was wild because I had her page up in front of me when I read it. So I wonder if I just had it filtered incorrectly and left off certain tournaments, but we 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 talked about the uh the podium finish at the 
uh, U.S. Women's Disc Golf Championship. She also finished third at the Portland Open. And was there another one? Maybe this is a false seventh at MVP oh, top Open. Top ten, sure. Yeah, top ten was. Uh, yeah, so MVP Open was seventh, third at Portland Open, third at U.S. Women's Champions, and tenth at tenth at OTB. If we're talking full and top tenth 10. at OTB, yes. So there yeah. you go, quick Morgan okay. for us. Our bad Ella. All right, that is going to do it for today's show. Thank you so much for tuning in. We're going to probably do some mailbag next week, so it's a great opportunity to get your questions in. You can send them over to upshot at ultiworld.com or hit us up in the Discord. We always look forward to hearing from you and we can't wait to get your questions. After Las Vegas, before Waco, what's on your mind? Let us know. Upshot at ultiworld.com. For Josh Mansfield, I'm Charlie Eisenhood saying so long and we'll talk to you next week right here on The Upshot.